Hi, my name is Kate Petherham. I'm a consultant neurologist from Sunderland in the northeast of England, and I'm here with my friend and colleague Wallace Brownlee to talk about our highlights from the recent EAN virtual conference. Um, so we're here to feedback on some of the things that we've heard about or are relevant to progressive MS. Um, often this is a slightly less exciting or depressing part of, of, of feeding back, and I think there's I was going to kind of feed back on two negatives and then finish with a positive, um, Wallace. So a couple of negative trials, uh, the first being the mesenchymal stem cells in MS. Um, I don't know if you missed that at Ectrims, because I think it was presented there. Um, but this was a, a phase two double blind crossover trial of mesenchymal stem cells in active MS. So they looked at 127 patients with primary progressive relapsing remissing or secondary progressive MS, but with active um, either relapses or um, activity on an MRI scan. And the two primary endpoints they were looking for were kind of safety and efficacy. Um, I suppose from a positive point of view, it was, it was found to be pretty safe, um, but unfortunately it didn't meet its primary income, primary, um, outcome on gadolinium enhancing lesions. So there was no difference between the two groups. So slightly disappointing, but I think uh, what they would say in a positive point of view was that there was a trend towards a reduced um, annualized relapse rate at, at 24 weeks. And actually it was probably never really intended to show a dramatic effect on activity. Um, and the idea being is that it's not going to substitute disease modifying therapies, but perhaps to Add as an add-on treatment to kind of promote tissue and neural repair. Mm. Um, did you kind of have any thoughts or how do you think, you know, I, I guess, where do you see this fitting in our kind of current armory of, of MS treatments? I think it's really tough, Kate, because I, I, I don't know how much more negative uh, work we need on stem cell, on, on mesenchymal stem cells to, to put this to bed. Yeah, I think it's interesting that I think even in the last couple of years, MS Society has given a huge graft towards mesenchymal stem cell research. And I'm, I'm just not sure whether uh, this is clearly not the final nail in the coffin because things are ongoing. But I, I really struggle to see how this is going to fit into the paradigm in, 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 in the future. Because it's a fairly invasive thing, isn't it? It's a, it's a boat they use in taking bone marrow. And then it's an intravenous treatment. So it's not kind of, whilst you know, it's safe in inverted commas, it's not kind of, not, you know, not completely um, non-invasive. So yeah, I'd be inclined to agree with you on that one. Um, so the other kind of slightly disappointing negative trial from, an, uh, from a progressive MS point of view was the SPI2 trial. So this was on the high dose biotin. Uh, and this was done, so this is a phase three study um, no, sorry, they did a phase, a small phase three study, SPI1, which did show a, a significant improvement in disability um, in non-active uh, progressive MS. So this was designed to kind of try and replicate those findings. Uh, and so, so it's a much bigger trial, double blinded. Um, but unfortunately, on this occasion, the primary endpoint wasn't met. Mm. Um, and so there was a 12% improvement um, with the biotin, but a 9% with placebo. So I mean, what did you have any? Is, does this surprise you? Does this is this kind of what you expected? You know. Well, I think it was. I think it was disappointing. Um, the earlier phase three study, the SPI one study, had looked really promising on a really tough endpoint for a progressive MS trial, confirmed disability improvement. There was yeah. a signal, um, and patients jumped on this bandwagon. I had, I, you know, I had plenty of people that I see in my clinic. Uh, who you know, went on to high dose biotin, um, and we did the SPI2 study at Queen Square. I had, I've got quite a number of patients who are on the trial, um, and it, it's hugely disappointing. I guess, like always, it's going to give us insights that will help us design trials better in the future and better understand progressive MS. So it's not all bad news, but um, it's it, it certainly. Um, um, not good to hear that although biotin might be good for your hair and nails probably no good for your progressive MS 
Yeah, I guess one slightly silver lining, I think, if you're going to take anything out of the subgroup analysis, they did find that it was if you've got in a, in European young females who have a BMI of less than 26, there was a trend to benefit. So um, I don't know if we're allowed to call ourselves European anymore and can apply that to any of our <laughs> patient group. Um, <laughs> but How I guess... How many statistical tests does they have to do to get to that? Yeah. Yeah. I, think it's, it's I think it was probably, yeah, shame. Mm, I agree. Um, I guess uh, from a, so to end or kind of continue with a positive slant for, for practical rest about the disease, there were a couple of um, MRI studies looking from the EXPAND study for saponamod. I don't know if you caught those ones. Um, yeah. So one was looking at uh, the grey matter atrophy. And we, I think that's taken to be a fairly good uh, marker or a grey matter actually being a driver of progression in progressive disease. And so they wanted to look at the effect of saponamod compared to placebo in the cortical grey matter and the thalamic um, grey matter, uh, thalamic atrophy in the subgroups of secondary progressive MS patients. And they did find that with um, saponamod, there was a significant decrease in the cortical grey matter atrophy in all the subgroups compared with placebo and quite impressively a kind of 47% in the treatment group compared with 70% in not and, and similarly with the thalamic atrophy so I guess for me that's that's kind of hopeful because I think you know probably saponamod will be approved for people with active sorry active secondary progressive MS but this perhaps suggests that there may be you know a a more kind of wide reaching effect on an actual atrophy and therefore progression that might be potentially useful for people that don't necessarily have obvious active disease. I don't know if you kind of had similar conclusions from that or. Yeah, I, I agree, Kate. Um, I think that the real area of unmet need in progressive MS, of course, is in the non active group. Um, yeah. the, there is, of course, some animal data and some limited human pharmacokinetic data with CSF sampling and so forth to suggest that saponamod does penetrate the CMS. And I think that, you know, the idea that it might cross um, the blood brain barrier and be impacting on inflammation that may not be obvious with a gadolinium enhanced MRI scan. So that, you know, that might include um, meningeal pathology, which we know is a key driver of progression in uh, MS and uh, grey matter atrophy or volume loss in the cortical grey matter and also the thalamus of course um, can be a reflection of um, damage from um, you know, the CSF inflammatory milieu or from um, follicles and the meninges that damage the underlying grey matter. So I think all of this is, is interesting and pointing in a direction that saponamod you know, may have neuroprotective effects over and above uh, a reduction in relapses in this uh, secondary progressive cohort and measure the focal inflammatory disease that we can see on MRI in terms of new T2 lesions or gadolinium enhancing. I think another another uh, abstract that starts to support this was another sub study from Expand, which was looking at MTR, yeah. um, and uh, we know that MTR is a surrogate marker, particularly for myelination. Um, MTR signal also reflects the, the number of axons that we can have too, but um, in this MTR sub-study, which is a novel endpoint really for a phase three clinical trial, um, saponamod was found to attenuate the decline that occurred in um, MTR in normal appearing brain tissues and also in, in cortical grey matter. Um, what was even more interesting for me was actually they looked at people who had newly forming lesions over the study. So someone on study gets a new T2 lesion and they, they looked at what happened in the MTR inside that lesion and in people treated with saponamod um, there was improvement in MTR 
compared with the placebo-treated patients in newly formed lesions. So that might even suggest that suppression of this inflammatory activity may promote remyelination. So I, I found that really exciting, and yeah. I'm really hopeful saponamod will enter our, um, our treatment landscape in the, in the next few months. I hope the NICE will take a favourable view on this. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I was going to say exactly the same thing about the MTR and, and the kind of remyelination. I think, um, I guess we talked about switching before and, you know, this wasn't particularly looked at, but one of the kind of, I guess, situations where we may use it is people that have been on a disease modifying therapy and are perhaps are starting to progress and aren't having relapses. But, you know, I always feel very uncomfortable just stopping disease modifying therapies in those situations. And so, it would be nice to kind of transition somebody from a treatment for relapsing remitting MS to something for secondary progressive MS. And I think this gives me more confidence that that will be an effective and, and a sensible thing to do. Absolutely. Um, there was some other MRI about um, the, the, the expanding lesions in MS as an endpoint for clinical trials and a small study that looked at that and the comparison between natalizumab and fingolimod. Did you catch that and have any kind of comments or thoughts about, about, that, um, about that abstract? Well, I think slightly expanding lesions are an interesting and potentially quite novel MRI biomarker that might be linked to progression. and. Um, I think that this story is still unfolding. Um, I was interested to see that there, um, um, you know, as you say, in the small study looking at a difference in um, the effect on slowly expanding lesions for uh, people treated with natalizumab versus Um I, I think this is all hypothesis generating and something to watch in the future for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was the result was highly surprising in that natalizumab did better than fingolimod, so it was perhaps more of an exercise in using that as an endpoint and, and a, a something to study and potentially something we can study without kind of very fancy scans and scans that people are having done already. So that's a, an interesting Absolutely. thing for the future. Good. Thank you, Wallace. Thank you, Kate. Very interesting as always.